things in your name. Amen. All right. Um, so we are in chapter three uh, tonight, and um, we're going to, the, the, the first two chunks of chapter three uh, come in verses one to six, and then there's this extended quote from a psalm um, from seven to, to 11. Um, and uh, uh, FYI, Gloria D. Uh, Bunny just put in the chat, the doctor orders the handicap card and then one goes to DPS to get it. Um, so that's, it, whenever two bureaucracies kind of get involved, it slows things down. Um, thank you, uh, Bunny, for, for naming that. So let's, um, let's take uh, verses one through six first. Um, and I'd love it if someone would be able to read chapter three of Hebrews verses one through six. Would somebody be willing to do that? Thank you, Reeve. Let us know what translation you're using. I'm using the Common English Bible. The pericope starts with, we are Jesus' house. Therefore, brothers and sisters who are partners in the heavenly calling, think about Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him just like Moses was faithful in God's house. But he deserves greater glory than Moses in the same way that the builder of the house deserves more honor than the house itself. Every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant in order to affirm the things that would be spoken later. But Jesus was faithful over God's house as a son. We are his house if we hold on to the confidence and the pride that our hope gives us. Thank you, Reeve. <clears throat> um, so I, I, as, as you're kind of digesting this, let me, let me share just a couple of thoughts with you and then I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so, all right, uh, we have, uh, I, I, I love how, uh, Reeve, would you, would you read the, the title of the pericope that uh, uh, you said at the very beginning once more? Um, I, <laughs> I changed to amplify, uh, I've oh. got it here. Uh, we are Jesus, I never can, how do you say the plural of Jesus? I mean, the, the possessor, <laughs> Jesus is, even though there's not all those S's, we are Jesus's house. Mm. I like that. I like that, that sort of summary of, of what's being said here. I dig that. Um, the, the title that, I've, that I worked with for this PowerPoint was God's house, uh, God's house and God's rest. Um, so how I, uh, if, if you're seeing the, the outline that I sent out, I think at the very beginning of, of the, the Hebrew study, um, the title that I had for this and the outline was contrasting Jesus and Moses. And I think that's right. But I think that more importantly, what's going on is talking about a, a place that you can call home, a place where we're, uh, what is it? What is it that, that Pumbaa says? Um, uh, a place where your rump rests in the Lion King? That's what that's what home is. Home is where you rest. Something like that. I, I'm seeing a couple nods, so I'm, I must not be too far off base. Um, and I think that while there's some contrasting that happens with Jesus and Moses here, that that's maybe more the point of of this first chunk. Um, now I want to know from you all, based on on what you heard in this reading, how is God's house described in and what you heard here? How is God's house described? You can go ahead and raise your hand or unmute or whatever if you've got something. I saw Jim unmute. Well, at the end, it says we are God's house. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, and that's really important. And that's, that's one of the key points here, that we are God's house. And we are his home. Very good. Thank you, Jim. What else do you see uh, about God's house here? Yeah, read. Oh, you'll need to unmute, my friend. It says Moses was a servant 
in God's house. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. So there's got to be a room for servants in God's house. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in some capacity, right? Um, what is it? Uh, uh, the, the good old prophet, Bob Dylan, everybody's going to have to serve someone. Uh, and uh, you may serve the devil, you may serve the Lord. Um, but, uh, you know, in God's house, uh, there's, there's a room for you, right? There's, there's some truth there. Um, go ahead, Emily. Uh, God built it. God, yeah. he's the builder. Yeah, he's the yeah. builder. Mm -hmm. That's right, because he's the builder of all things. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's got to be the builder of the house. Very good. He's, go ahead, Gloria. And he's our builder. He's the builder. Yeah. He built us and we are his house, too. Right. So, nice. Right, these are good. Uh, Elaine, I saw you on mute as well. No, okay. Um, very good. Uh, let me um, highlight some of these things. So um, I had I had just a, a handful of things highlighted and, and you got all of them and then some. Um, that Moses was faithful in God's house, specifically read as you said, as a, as a servant is what it says in verse five. Um, that Christ was faithful over God's house. I don't know if there's a, like, I, I don't like leaning on prepositions too much because they tend to give when you lean on them. Um, but like whether they're, you know, Moses is faithful in and Jesus was faithful over God's house. I don't know if there's something there, but I thought that was kind of neat. I think maybe more important is that Moses was a servant. Christ was a son. Um, and, and that because of that, you know, we, we, like we saw in the, in the last chapter, we get to kind of follow Christ on that parabola of salvation, um, where, you know, Christ came down to us so we could come up with him. And, and finally, most importantly, perhaps we are God's house. Um, and Sarah, I saw that you had unmuted and Dave, it looks like you might want to, you might want to add something as well. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Well, um, my verse six, uh, the last the second part of it is and we are as house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence uh -huh. and the hope in which we glory which i love that phrasing mm -hmm. um which is niv by the way <laughs> but i thought it, the house is our hope yeah yeah so it's it's not yes. an unconditional you are god's house right it's you are god's house if um and and, and i like I, I like how the niv renders it too i thank you for sharing that sarah i dig that uh, Dave, did you want to add something? You you had your your hand raised a little bit. Uh, the I'm I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, and as it puts it, but Christ was faithful as a son over his household. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's there, there's uh, I was um, looking at John ten earlier today, uh, and there's there's a buy-in that you have when you're the shepherd or when you're the son, as opposed to when you're the servant or the hired hand. Um, and so, being faithful over the house as a son, yeah, there's there's something there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dave. Well, uh, I did the same thing. Thank you, Gloria. Elaine, let's let's go to you. Well, I just have a kind of a question because it says Moses was faithful in God's uh, house as a servant. Right. And Moses was a human being, and we're human beings. Uh -huh. So does this mean that we are also servants? Yeah, it's it's tough when preachers start mixing their metaphors, like this preacher in Hebrews does, right? Like he's, he's talking about Moses is a servant in the house, but then we are the house, but are we also servants? And I think that one of the things that he's getting at here is that we have a bigger role to play in some capacity than even Moses did. Uh, Moses came into God's house as it was revealed in the tabernacle, but we have God living in us. Um, and and how, how awesome is that? That, that as, as just radically important and as faithful as Moses was, he didn't get to see God nearly as intimately as we do on a daily basis. Uh, so not that Moses is somehow less than, but that God's glory has been revealed in so much more of a fashion that we get to be God's very house. Um, I, th I think that might be what, what the, the author of Hebrews is going for here. I don't know if that answers your, your question, though. Did that help at all? <laughs> kind of. It's not, I think we are also God's servants uh, to, to some degree there, um, uh, but not in the same way that Moses was. We get to. Well, and, and we're called his children. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Right. 
Very good. Thank you. Emily, Hobby. Um, I have a question. I have the old RSV, and my verse four is in parentheses. I, I don't think I've ever, no, I never noticed a verse in parentheses before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the new, the new RSV has it, has it in parentheses as well. Why, why would that be? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, so Greek doesn't have parentheses. Um, Greek also doesn't have quotation marks, uh, which makes it terribly hard to figure out some of this stuff. But um, sometimes people put parentheses around it, um, like translators will, in order to help you follow the flow of the argument. Um, and it may be that the translator thought like this was more of an aside, like maybe the preacher is, you know, getting in the swing and then it's like, you know, a builder of the house is more honored than the house itself. And yeah, every house has been built somewhere. Everything's been built by God. But Moses was faithful in all God's, like maybe that's what, what the, okay. the translation is trying Thank to render. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, I think that the, the next piece here, um, building off of Sarah's question, is that if we are God's house, well, uh, what are we called to do? Um, and I think that we can, we can see this. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I saw your hand. Well, that's kind of the question I was pondering uh, on verse 5 in, in the Christian Standard Bible at it says Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household as a testimony to what would be said in the future. Well, who is giving that testimony in the future? Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. he talking about us? Is he talking about the apostles? Who is this future? That's the question I have. Right. right. Um, Hold on to that, bookmark that. Uh, I don't know that it's answered firmly in this, but I think that it, it, it's, it gets spoken to. Let's go to Bunny and then to Jim. It, in my translation, NIV, the beginning is the same. And then it says, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. Mm -hmm. Dave, does that answer your question? Uh, good. OK, thank you. Thank you, Bunny. That's, that's mm -hmm. uh, helpful. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, I, two two quick things. I, I was gonna my my I've got the New Living Translation, and five talks about uh, his work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. So, you know, uh, the testimony is what God would show later. I like that. That's cool. And one other question I had: we we talk about it says and we are God's house. Yeah. Before that, it says, but Christ, or in my translation, but Christ as the son is in charge of God's house. Yeah. Then it says, we are God's house. So I'm wondering if it says we are God's house because he's telling us that Christ is in charge of us, is in charge of the house. We are the house. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that's that's a really good reading of this. I'm going to stop my share just for a second so that you all can see one another while we while we talk through this a little more. Um, I saw Sarah unmute as well. Um, no, oh, from that must have been from earlier. Um, I, I think that this this is particularly poignant in our situation when we've not been able to worship on a regular basis in our sanctuary. Thinking about what is God's house. Um, uh, one of the things that we said early in the pandemic is that the church's doors may be closed, but the church does not close simply because the buildings uh, have to have to shut down. And I think that some of what the author of Hebrews is talking about here is getting at that same point, um, at least a little bit, that that we all are, are image bearers of God. We kind of carry God around in the places that we go, wherever we go, we are God's house um, and God's son, right? Like, like you were saying, Jim, that, that you know, Christ is faithful over God's house, not only all of creation, right? Which God created all of it, but particularly over us who have God's spirit and in, in, in a very deep way. Um, and, and I think that uh, the, the, the idea here that, that we're, what we're called to do is to hold firm to that confidence and pride, uh, or whatever, however your translation uh, renders it in, in verse six. We're God's house if we hold firm to these things and hope. 
Um, and, and that's something that I think is, is hard to do um, during a year like 2020, or it can be hard to do during a year like 2020. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to make sure that I'm leaving leaving some space if, if anybody has has thoughts or wants to expand on that at all. Okay, uh, seeing uh, I saw uh, I, in, in the chat Elaine says that you know yours your translation says to hold on to our courage and hope definitely needed in this pandemic. Amen. That's what Brian says. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a sort of reckless optimism, um, maybe not reckless optimism, but, but a, a, a belief that, that all will ultimately be well, that we carry around with us as Christians. Um, and so when it, when it, uh, uh, so my, my NRSV uh, says, um, holding firm to confidence and pride. And pride is not usually like a great word in scripture. <laughs> usually that's, that's a word that's, you know, kind of knocked because pride can be really uh, uh, damaging. But there's a certain almost pride that comes when we're able to say, uh, shout in the face of death, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? that Jesus has conquered even death. And there's, there's almost a, a boastfulness that comes from that when we're living out as Christians, this understanding that death is, does not have the final say in our lives. So uh, when we think about the confidence of pride that, that belong to hope, that may be one thing that comes to mind. Um, Dave, you were raising your hand. I, I, I was just pondering the thought that, um, we're not in the same building together, this group of what, 15, 16 people, but we're meeting in Christ's name. Are we not a church? Right. right. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, Christ said, there I am with them. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I think that fulfills verse seven. It doesn't matter whether it's a congregation meeting in a building of several thousand or it's two or three meeting in a basement. If they're meeting in Christ's name, it's a church, just as the early churches were. And it's it, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. That's it. <laughs> I think it's a whole heck of a lot easier to hold on to that confidence and and hope and pride that we have in Christ when we're together with fellow believers. Uh, I think that when we're on our own, when we when we feel lonely. Um, and, and feel isolated, it can be a lot more difficult to remember that Christ is faithful over God's house, regardless of what that looks like. Yeah. And I'd, I'd also point, uh, direct your attention to the very beginning of this passage um, that uh, the, the author of Hebrews calls us uh, sisters and brothers or, or, or siblings, that, that we are one family, right? Um, that, that we're holy partners in a heavenly calling is what my translation has. Holy partners, you know, so we're one, one family, we're holy, and a heavenly calling makes us apostolic. Um, you may have heard uh, that, that we are the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And in just a few words, uh, the author of Hebrews is getting at three of these four things, that we're one, we're holy, and we're apostolic. And as, as you know, be, those who are being sent out, we follow Christ, who is called an apostle here. I don't know if you caught that. I think yeah, that's kind of a, a neat idea. Um, what else do you see in this, in this uh, portion of Hebrews 3? <laughs> I really like the part where the, the end of six verse, and if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast, I think that is so important, so yeah. beautiful. Um, aside from Christianity and Christians and us as a group, I do yoga and in the middle of yoga, we always stop, put our hands over our hearts and say, all is well, all will be well. 
mm. not only with our bodies, but everything around us. Yeah. And then there's never any mention of Jesus, but but it but he's there. <laughs> Yeah, he's the one that makes all things well. Yes, exactly. And you may know the word uh, shalom in Hebrew, and it means peace, but it means so much more than than just peace. Uh, it means all is all is right with the world. Uh, it means that that we have room to flourish. Um, to to like be that. who God has made us to be. Um, All is well with the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a sense of divine completeness when something has shalom, uh, and that's sure. what's being, I think, promised here. Um, that that this hope that we have in in the shalom that Jesus brings. Hmm. Well, are you ready to uh, to get into rest? Uh, and and by rest, I, I mean both, you know, uh, resting, but also the rest of this uh, this passage, uh, seven through eleven. Um, would uh, I? I'd like two readers actually. Um, uh, yeah, oh yeah, Jim, you're saying I love the hymn that ends, "All is well with my soul," a very peaceful thing. Mm -hmm. It is. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. That one. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't remember them all, but all the words, but I just love the, and I sure don't want to sing it, but uh, I just love the way it ends. That just, when you think all is well with your soul, that's your, that's your entire being. So if all is well with your entire being, it can't get any better than that. Um, that's that's a hymn that it's also good to know the story of, and I'd encourage you to, if, if, if you've not read the history of It Is Well With My Soul, go ahead and check that out after we're done tonight. Uh, it's, a, it's a very touching story. Um, I'd, uh, th yeah, thank you for, for naming that, Jim. Um, so for this, for the rest of, of this section, 7 through 11, I'd like two readers. I'd like for somebody who's willing to read uh, what we have in Hebrews and then um, I'd like somebody to read what we, uh, how it goes in Psalm 95. And I have a specific translation of Psalm 95 that I'll put up uh, on the slide so that you can read it from there. Um, in fact, I'll put it up now so that you can kind of compare and contrast. I saw Reed raise your hand. Would you like to read one of these? And then I saw Gloria D raise her hand as well. Um, Reed, would you read the, uh, the Hebrews? Peace and then Gloria, would you read the piece that just popped up on the screen? Uh, go ahead, read. Uh, you can go first and let us know what translation you're reading from. This is the NIV. So, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where you ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest." Thank you, Reed. Um, well read. And Gloria D, um, I have this this translation that I've got up before you is a translation by uh, uh, a, a guy named Robert Alter. Um, I love his translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Okay. Um, I think he does a really good job. He's got the right sort of poetry and rhythm uh, that I think is lost in a lot of translations. So um, uh, no okay. pressure, Gloria. <laughs> um, God's rest. If you would, if you would only heed his voice. Do not harden your heart as at Mirabah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your forefathers tested me, tried me, though they had seen my acts. Forty years I loathed a generation, and I said, they are a people of wayward heart, and they did not know my ways. Against them I swore in my wrath, they shall not come to my resting place. Nice. Thank you, Gloria. Um, some of you may remember 
those names, Masa and Meriba. Are those ringing any bells uh, deep within your brain from way, way back in our Exodus Bible study for those of you who were, who were with us then? Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I, I hear yes. I, I see Dave nodding as well. Um, if, uh, if, if, if you remember, and, and no pressure if you don't, those are kind of strange names. Uh, so, and they only come up, I think, once in the Exodus narrative. Um, if, if anyone who remembers would like to share a little bit uh, from, from what you remember, that would be super. And then we can um, think through this passage a little more. Uh, Bunny, were you raising your hand? Yeah, go ahead. Doesn't it have something to do with the, the lack of water and their grumbling and fussing? Oh, excellent. Very good. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, you, can, you can read the whole story uh, if you want to reread it. It's in Exodus 17. Um, they just got away from the Egyptians. The Egyptians had just had all this water crash down on them from the Red Sea. And the Israelites were excited. They were triumphant. And then they started wandering in the desert and they got thirsty and they accused Moses of dragging them out there to starve and to die of thirst in the desert. And uh, yeah, they, they uh, actually started, you know, almost going through with a mutiny, right. And, and, and in their murmurings and grumblings, uh, finally, you know, Moses goes and pleads with God on their behalf and um, they get water at Massa and at Meribah uh, are the two places. So that's from Exodus 17. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's a real easy thing to, as we're traveling through the wilderness to get real frustrated with God, um, because we don't know where deliverance is coming from. Um, and I think that (laughs) it's, this, this is not in that sense, a very hopeful Psalm. It's, it's almost like rah, 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 rah uh, at, at the people. Um, but I think that this, the, the author of Hebrews is using this um, as, as basically a way to say, you know, hey, this is not, this is not you. You uh, are not the people who, who, who God has, has spoken against. You are God's house. Um, and I'm wondering if, if any of you have thoughts on this. I'm going to stop the screen share for a minute. Um, and if you want me to pull this translation back up, I can, if there's something you want to compare and contrast with. But I, I'm wondering in your mind, why, why is this the place that, that the author of Hebrews goes next? Hmm. Hmm. Aren't they talking about being faithful? Yeah. That's a that's a good point, Steve. That's exactly right. That if if we're faithful to hold firm to the confidence we have in hope, uh, and if 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 these Israelites were were faithful to what God had asked them to do, you know that that would that would have good results. Did you want to say any anything more about that, Steve? I think that was that was a good point, and I want to make sure that I didn't cut you off. No, you, that and that was just what if, I guess I'm reading it and thinking about how. It, how that was reflecting back to um, to the first segment there is that it, it just 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 a saying is that you we've been told to, about this and uh, and our faithfulness was tested generations ago in Moses' time so you know it's it's an ongoing fight in maintaining that faithfulness always. Mm-hmm. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hobbies, uh, then Bunny, then Dave. Well, I, w- I was thinking about author's purpose of putting it here. People need to be, re- we need to be reminded. And, and that's, he's reminding the Hebrew people of their history and what the consequence of their behavior is in their history. Mm. Do you want new life? <laughs> you better change. <laughs> right actions have consequences and here's a very particular consequence that happened before yeah good um yeah. bunny then dave and then i'll get to what elaine put in the chat 
I just was interested in the little subtitles that my Bibles have. The NIV says warning against unbelief, but the New Jerusalem says how to reach God's land of rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which one do you think fits this section better, Bunny, if I were to put you on the spot there? Ah, well, there's more section, but um, I kind of like how to reach God's land of rest because it's in the positive. It's, you know, watch out, you don't do these things, you know, because that's not how to get there. Right. Good, thank you. I, I like that. Um, Dave. Well, I, I can only echo what's just being said. Uh, the, the pericope of in my Bible says warning against unbelief. And as you read that, that it really is a warning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this, I think last week, uh, uh, where chapter two opened with a warning and how Hebrews kind of goes back and forth between exhortation uh, and, and encouragement. And then like, hey, don't do this. Uh, and, and, and is a little more direct with the negative consequences. And, and this, this falls like right kind of in between a very clear exhortation encouragement section at the beginning of chapter three. And then for the rest of chapter three, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a warning section. You go ahead, Dave, if you finish your thought there. Isn't it also important to understand who he's talking to? You know, it, this, this is a, a special group of people, is it not? The, the Hebrew people he's talking to. So they're coming out of a totally different faith. And these are, you know, they, they should know this history very well. And uh, in the previous verse, uh, up in the next section, uh, verse five, when he talks about Jesus being more worthy of glory than Moses, mm -hmm. well, Moses to them was such an important figure. Yeah. This must have been very striking for them to hear that someone's more worthy than Moses. Right. Uh, I think we have to keep in mind who he's talking to. Right, right. Thank you. Um, that that this would have absolutely been something that they knew, um, and and that they would have held Moses in very high esteem. Um, thank you for naming that, Dave. I said I'd get to Elaine's comment, and then I saw Kurt's hand. Um, uh, Elaine, I, I like what you said, and and Gloria, it looks like you agree with her too. I'm seeing a lot of similarities between our pandemic wilderness and our grumbling, and maybe not even trusting God. Yeah, I think that there's there's a lot of truth there. Um, and it, it's so much easier, right, to point the finger at the Israelites and say, you should have done better. But then when it comes to us, like, oh, no. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it is a hard thing to trust God for our daily bread in that regard. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Kurt? When you, when you think about this, these, uh, these people lived much closer to uh, they didn't have the luxuries that we have for food or water. And uh, I would think it would have been very easy to be discouraged a lot of the time, you know, and to, to say to people, you must have hope uh, at a time probably when they were struggling all the time. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, we, we live in a better we will live in a better life, I think, in many ways than they do. Even with the COVID, you know, we have health care and so forth. I, it's just I'm just struck by by this. You know, it's so powerful to to uh, to talk about hope in this way. Yeah. Yeah, like these these were people that that lived without central air, right? <laughs> like of of all the things, I, I I you know I don't know that I would be able to live in Texas without central air, um, and and you know not only that, but just like you said, where did their water come from? Where did their food come from? Good I was, grief! I was going to say, just consider the fact that we have clean water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They never knew if they were drinking clean water or not. Well, I think we have a lot of people in the world still living in those conditions, no water, 
no electricity or filthy water no home um and danger a lot of danger a lot of violence yeah yes the, I, I think that there's there's the the joke maybe you've heard the the phrase first world problems before uh, the, the the sort of problems like you know I uh, yeah my 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 seat heaters in my car don't work so my bottom is going to be cold when I drive because it's you know 40 degrees out you know and, and these are the sorts of things that like <laughs> they're they're funny. We, when we talk about it because you only have that problem if you live in the lap of luxury. And yet, right, there are certain first world problems that that really like, like, I, I don't want to want to play them down too much because they are dangers for people. People do have real fears um, that that they won't be able to make ends meet even in the richest country in the world that we have here in America. Um, and you're also right that, that when we compare some of the things that we call suffering, when we compare that with people who are, who are actually suffering, um, yeah, it, it, I think it, it leads to some questions, it leads to some questions um, that there are so many reasons we can have hope. Uh, even in the midst of COVID. And again, that's not to, that's not to knock those of you who have truly suffered or those of you who have loved ones who have truly suffered because of COVID, their suffering is valid, um, uh, but there's so much we have to be thankful for here. Oh, yes, yes. So much. Um, if you go away with nothing else, and, and I'll have this be my last thought and I'd be open to other folks' last thoughts as well, but if you go away with nothing else, um, I, go away knowing that you are God's house. Um, and it is, uh, when we think about our first house, right, that's the place that we could find some rest. Um, and that God has made us a place where God finds rest. Um, and there's something really beautiful in that, that if God is willing to find rest in us, then even in the midst of suffering, we can find rest in God not just the rest that's promised for us someday, but also, you know, pit stops during the journey that God's open to that. I'd be interested to hear um, a, a couple other final thoughts if folks have them before we pray and end for the night. I see Emily Hobby. Go ahead. Yeah. I, or Reeve Hobby. Uh, I, I pulled up the Amplify. I keep switching Bibles. That's mm -hmm. one of the neat things about having the uh, <clears throat> multiple Bibles. Mm -hmm. um, that last verse there, they shall not enter my rest, the promised land. Mm -hmm. Yeah that this, this was the home that God had prepared for them. Yeah. And when we are God's house, then we can enter that home that he's prepared for us. Yeah, yeah thank you, Reeve. Uh, thank you for, for drawing our attention to that. Uh, any, any other thoughts or do we feel okay for the night? Yeah, Gloria D, go ahead. Um, can we say house equals temple? If we are the temple of God, I've heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we go to a temple mm -hmm. to be with God? I think that's a beautiful way to say it, Gloria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Is it, what is a temple but a house for, for God? Um, and, and in this case, house for the God. It's good. Thank you. Um, it, it, I know that that some of this we may still be chewing on some stuff in in, in our heads, and that's fine. 
Um, so I, I don't mean to rush your thoughts. Uh, and if you've got further thoughts on this that you'd like to share next week, you can of course go. Um, I, I like that, Elaine. The warnings in this passage can be worrisome or overwhelming, but the bottom line is our belief saves us. When we trust in God, right? That, that is what saves us. And that is basically simple. Yeah, good. Um, would somebody be so kind as to close us in prayer tonight? Thank you, Emily. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the blessings in our lives. We ask you to have mercy on those who are suffering with this disease um, and give encouragement to those who are suffering in other ways. Uh, we give thanks for Joel's leadership and for the fellowship of of our fellow believers here that are gathered. Um, be with us as we go forward during this season of Advent and help us welcome Jesus into our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>